information wasn't just given to the model sequentially, but also spatially, or in other words, um, it didn't just learn from data flow, like static analyzers, which are sequential, but also um, control flow, right? Which is essential for uh, executing different functions in different contracts and the whole uh, 3D space uh, between them all, right? Between all the, among all the function calls. GM, GM, everyone. My name is Degash, your host from Scraping Bits. And today I've got a special guest, Lucas Martin Cauldron. How's it going, friend? No, it's a pleasure, GM. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, of course. And we've never actually spoken before. I just kind of found you on Twitter. You look like you're doing some quite interesting things and wanted to get you on and have a chat. I think what a good intro it should be. Who are you and, and what do you do? Oh, that's uh, that's already a very good question. Um, so I am the founder and CEO of Fantastify. Mm-hmm. We are a actually a young startup uh, that is actually in the intersection between the the whole hype of artificial intelligence, smart contract security vulnerability, and uh, the blockchain space. So um, so yeah, we are hitting quite a quite a few points now, and and yeah, uh, can't wait for for the future. Yeah, the future is a certainly exciting thing, especially in the realm of cybersecurity and what you're doing as well, AI. Um, exactly. And I would like to touch on your two products. You have one that's in Web2 security and Web3 security. So how about you tell us a bit about those? No, absolutely. So Pentestify, we've got we've named everything, by the way, after The Matrix, The Matrix movie. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's it's one of my favorite. Um, so yeah, don't be don't be afraid if I use too much of that mind, nomenclature. No <laughs> it's problem. a favorite trilogy, uh, at least the first three, uh, three films. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got Neo and Morpheus. Mm-hmm. And then we've got something for the future called Academy, a bootcamp, but uh, focusing on on Neo. Neo is our actual, our flagship product. It detects the vulnerabilities in smart contracts using AI. We'll get more into that later, I'm sure. Yep. Uh, and then we've got Morpheus. Morpheus is actually the product from my previous company. Uh, I am a second time entrepreneur, and as I exited my my first company, okay, whose okay. product was based on the research on academic research uh, from my previous university, I took that product and transferred that to Pentestify. Uh, that was not easy, legally speaking, as you can expect, but yeah. it was successful. <laughs> and we, I actually started as a, as a pen tester, as an ethical hacker in the Web2 IT traditional security. Yeah. So we automated the entire process using AI uh, in ethical hacking, and then we were actually doing the same in, in Web3. First of all, congratulations to the exit. I am quite interested in how you actually got into Web2 cybersecurity, because that's something I've always wanted to do, but I kind of just skipped that and went straight to Web3. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be quite yeah, interesting no. there. Yeah, no, for, for sure. I'm quite, uh, I'm quite happy that I went that route. Uh, well, how much time you've got, it's actually a long story, but I, okay. <laughs> everything's, <laughs> uh, I'll give you the, 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 the minutes, the, the last minutes, the brief minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been, I actually started it when I was at school. I, I was quite fortunate to start, uh, programming with, uh, Scratch. I'm not sure if you've heard oh, that yes. program is, <laughs> maybe it's not even programming, but it's supposed to teach you that. And yeah. I loved it. Uh, I love being able to be a creator. Uh, with a computer. And I just thought of the scalability of that. At that time, I was 12, 13 years old. Mm-hmm. So um, I couldn't stop asking myself, how does that work? Why does that work? How would that work if I did that? So obviously, that led me to all those questions, led me to uh, tinkering with stuff, both electronics and software. Yep. And cybersecurity was the well just putting a word to the concept of what i was already doing so in terms of mindset i adopted it since i've always had an engineering mind right i always ask myself how how stuff works um and as soon as i got started programming i got started into the deep into the windows and mac os operating systems and the journey the the rest is history so um i i ranked top as well top percent in the world in hack the box try hack me shortly after so yeah it's uh i i dug deep into it and i and yeah i didn't exit since then <laughs> uh, i would love to talk about the come up of that, that initial startup how you kind of formed mm-hmm. it from the ground up and got to the point where you've had a successful exit because i don't think a lot of people even get to that point right they just make a startup see how it goes mm-hmm. and then sometimes it fails but some people like yourself get a successful exit out of it and then start something new i would like to no, sure. venture into that journey <laughs> no for sure we were um 
I've had many failures in the past as well. So uh, yeah. failing is something I'm extremely accustomed to <laughs> uh, yeah. for the worse or for the better. I definitely wasn't, it wasn't a big exit, but it was a uh, successful exit in the business, which was mm-hmm. honestly what um, what a co-founder hopes for as well. And uh, well, given how many bad things could happen, right? Mm-hmm. And I got started because as I said, the question, how does that work, led me to cyber, but cyber wasn't good enough. I was hungry actually for more. Mm-hmm. And I said, how can I make an impact in the world? Um, I wasn't a hundred percent passionate about AI as I, as I was about cyber, but I knew that whether I liked it or not, uh, it would be very difficult to have a successful business in the future uh, where AI wasn't present. Something, something like if I wanted to become a writer and I didn't know how to write, right? AI is that knowing how to write, then the, yeah. the whole story is uh, cybersecurity. So I, I've seen that since, yeah, since 15 years old and since then as a hobby, and then it became more official, I I dug into, into AI. So my first company was an alignment between them two, uh, automating the ethical hacking process using um, several models such as DRLs, so deep reinforcement learning, mm-hmm. and, and many others. So, so yeah, it was pretty much an intersection doomed to happen uh, in, in, in the right way yeah. uh, between these two technologies. AI is quite a powerful tool, and I think in the coming years, it's going to be very much more significant than it is right now with ChatGPT4. I know that really took off, and it's kind of on <laughs> everyone's mind. But in the future, it's definitely going to be a significant factor in every business, uh, no matter what it is. And you can do some really interesting things with it, right? Something very interesting is using it for fuzzing. That's something I'm looking Mm -hmm. into, exploring. And I wonder if you're taking that route in any way with with your tools. No, for sure. Uh, Fuzzing is definitely one of the strong suits of of AI. It is not the one that we follow up and testify. In fact, our route is mostly... Uh, what are the current state of the art tools in the static field, uh, okay. as well as the dynamic? So tools like, you know, Slither, Mantico, Trolls of Bits are doing an amazing job. At that. I was talking to them actually, uh, yesterday and they, yeah, they were saying they've got extremely interesting things in, uh, stored mm-hmm. in, in store. So, so we Relating didn't to want AI. to follow with, with AI. Um, okay, they right. don't want to disclose any more information, but they're definitely looking deep into it and developing a tool. Uh, with it. Yeah. So, so I can't wait to, to see that. Uh, but coming back to, to your question, right? Mm-hmm. About why we do not use AI for fuzzing. It was mostly because, not because it is not an amazing area to explore and very lucrative, I'm, I'm sure in the future, mm-hmm. but mostly because we wanted to make sure that the tools that are already in the market are pretty good at what they do already. Slither as a static analyzer, uh, or Securify or all these other tools do a pretty good job. Uh, so yeah. do Manticore, you know, uh, other fuzzers as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and we wanted to explore a whole new area where the data wasn't done uh, sequentially. So yeah. there wasn't that very clear data flow, but in- instead there was a control flow as well. Yeah. So we decided to focus on that. But given especially the creativity that we've been able to see from in the, in, in, in the recent months, in the, in the past few months, uh, fuzzing is just one of the best candidates actually um, as well for, for AI. And if you've read any of like Trailer Bits' papers, they've done some studies on uh, fuzzing and invariant testing. And in Web3, that yeah. takes a large portion of uh, successful findings, right? I think it's like 60% plus or even higher, which exactly. is quite interesting. But I think automating the invariance is the hardest thing though because you don't know basically the business logic um, prior to these, the fuzzers, right? Um, so I think that's the hardest thing. But it would be interesting to see someone try to do that. Um, but I think that's probably one of the most complex problems you can get in, in a in security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, AI is coming to to these white collar, uh, most intellectual jobs. So I would I would probably expect the whole business logic, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than being a limiting factor, been uh, another reason why maybe adding transformer networks, um, would be, would be able to solve that problem because Mm -hmm. that requires a comprehension of what's written, a comprehension of, of the uh, business itself. 
Right. And generally speaking, NLPs such as such as those that use transformers like GPT four and, and all this that we've been hearing about, mm-hmm. maybe they could help. And I would I wouldn't be surprised if the business logic was mostly taken care of by by an NLP in the in, in the coming future. For it to even comprehend what it's like meaning to do it would be difficult because maybe there was something implemented that wasn't meant to be implemented in, in that way, but it's not like documented anywhere and then it would just have to assume that it's right. So I think exactly. that's, that's kind of the hardest thing um, for like AI that's right. or anybody to, you know, detect. But I would like to go onto your web free tool because I think that might be a bit interesting. Um, so yeah, how, what does that look like? Yeah, so we've been, uh, as I said, the, the main point was, was saying what tools exist nowadays and how can we make the the field better. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, there is a very difficult, uh, a very different uh, thing that the mission of the company yep. and the vision of the company. Yep. Our vision is to to have at least 60% of all transactions within DeFi go through our smart contracts mm-hmm. and detect uh, from directly from the bytecode whether something specially and sequentially looks like a vulnerability or like an attack. Mm-hmm. That is our very optimistic vision that we think we can achieve. However, the the mission of the company is is quite different, is and it's actually quite personal. Mm-hmm. the The Web three space, for sure, whether we uh, whether people want it or not, is the next evolution of the internet. I think at least yeah. we can uh, agree on that. For for all this, yeah, for the non believers in the blockchain, right out there. Mm-hmm. However, blockchain, many people think that it gives complete anonymity and it is a tool to be private. Uh, mm-hmm. And to execute that right of, of digital privacy, mm-hmm. that I mean, I come from a web to uh, cybersecurity background, right? So it, it is difficult for me to say that we had that right <laughs> always uh, in uh, in privacy uh, regarding cybersecurity. Of course, uh, we know how spionage works and, and things like that. So definitely, it wasn't hundred percent safe, but mm-hmm. it could have been much worse. We live in a world in a world at least where privacy is a human right, uh, digital privacy as well. So um, I'm actually seeing how the world is evolving, especially with CBDCs and the, the you know, how Davos and, and, and the WEF and, and, and BIS and all these banks um, want the future to look like. And that future actually makes me afraid and makes me um, have a big concern about the, the future of digital privacy. Yeah. And... Exactly. So the, the good thing about this is can testify us as a company and, and community as well. Most importantly, our community. We don't have to be, we don't have to conquer the market to convince people um, of what can be done with the blockchain, um, how human rights in terms of privacy could be protected with the blockchain, mm-hmm. legally speaking, of course. And um, I do believe that even if we are just 10% of that spark, that 10% is going to, is going to Put the ninety percent remaining on on fire, right? Yeah. There won't be a a possibility of a government or a big enough institution to say that's how it is. That's the privacy that comes with the blockchain. Because as soon as one person out of seven eight billion that we are today, as long as one person says, "Hey, this other company is actually protecting our privacy that way," in terms of security, in terms of everything, um, then. Uh, it would be much more difficult for these big corporations to to establish that truth, which is not really that truth, right? Yeah. So that's our mission, to make sure that the world can see that the blockchain is a double-edged sword and could be used to protect still our right to privacy. So it's uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's the, the, the real thing behind. I totally agree with these big corporations or governments hiding through the truth and making it all up. It's totally possible, right? Like they, if someone controls everything, they can do really whatever they want. Exactly. Cybersecurity is extremely important in this day and age because our whole lives revolve around the internet. I'm more scared of someone breaking, not breaking in to my home, but breaking into my email and you know, all my exactly. digital accounts, because if you lose that, you kind of lost everything, really. Yeah. Unless you just have all your money, et cetera, in, in like physical form, someone can just go on to you know, digital exactly. and kind of <laughs> steal your identity <laughs> and become you. Hashtag <laughs> ledger, anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I 100% agree with that. And um, it, it's, it's a very important thing. But I do want to get more technical now and get into kind of the weeds 
of your tool and how we built it from the ground up. I know it's a very difficult journey and I, will, I like to see, uh, understand the process you took to get it to where it is now. Yeah, and, and of course it continues to be a, a challenge, especially because we are at several frontiers that wherever we want to look at, that could be considered a PhD in itself, right? So yeah. so we uh, the, the journey is definitely not easy, not because uh, there is a lot of work to do, but because there is a, a lot of work that hasn't been done before. Yeah. So, uh, so for sure, we are definitely pioneers in that field. But um, how we started it from scratch, the starting with the concept, it came right at the end of my previous company where I said blockchain is still growing. I was already... Five years prior, I was already within the blockchain weeds and, and, and things like that. So yeah. I've always been a, a big fan, as I said, uh, since very early on of blockchain. And um, I said, what if we're able to automate the exact same thing in Web 2, but in Web 3? Mm -hmm. So how that's how it came to fruition. And then we said, with the current tools that we could consider in the following categories, right? Formal verification, which is very mathematical based, uh, intense, uh, static uh, analyzers, as well as uh, dynamic, if we count symbolic execution and intermediate representation as static as well. Mm -hmm. um, so with all of that, uh, all of them, um, it's not that they needed to be replaced. They had very good strengths and most of them were open source. Mm -hmm. So I said, definitely that wouldn't be a competitive field. What about creating a new category? And then of course, uh, you, you question about all the difficulties in the market that there is, whether there is truly a need for that and, and, and so on. And I said, where do most attacks, well, actually all of them happen post deployment. How many companies or tools are actually analyzing things post deployment? Mm -hmm. Actually not many. In fact, I had very a big difficulty finding a single one. Yeah. And I do not mean tools, amazing tools from Open Zeppelin, such as Defender or Tenderly. Those are mostly uh, monitoring tools, right? Yeah. I mean, deeply uh, security analyzers. And I said, if post deployment, these tools, these smart contracts, right, most likely they've gone through static, dynamic, formal, only God knows why, <laughs> what, what else. Yeah. So we can definitely compete in the same arena. And the, therefore, a new category uh, that would surpass the accuracy of these tools, otherwise uh, it would be for nothing, would need to be created. And that actually came to uh, deep learning. Um, I cannot get much into detail about exactly which models we use, but I could definitely tell you that um, the deep reinforcement learning models that we use have a particularity, which is being able to... Um, so you know that you normally have a master node where it actually gathers all the learning experiences of the agents. Mm -hmm. And the agents are these, these lines of code um, devoted to trying things out at first randomly and then right. uh, through a feedback loop, a reward system, uh, improving their accuracy and their intuition, in quotes. Mm -hmm. So by mixing these agents with other types of state-of-the-art AI that we developed in-house, we realized that now this policy from the deep reinforcement learning um, algorithm model could sense smart contracts or the bytecode um, through different ways of thinking, such as information wasn't just given to the model sequentially, but also spatially, or in other words, um, it didn't just learn from data flow, like static analyzers, which yeah. are sequential, but also um, control flow, right? Which yep. is essential for uh, executing different functions in different contracts and the whole uh, 3D space uh, between them all, right? Between all the, among all the function calls. So that in itself was a whole different category that was able to detect variations of very simple uh, um, vulnerabilities such as reentrancy. And yep. we said we've hit maybe potentially something big. So um, I went to UCL, University College London. Yep. They were absolutely very keen on developing that idea, working on that. Um, it got me my master's. Um, it got me uh, the PhD, which um, just for clarification, I haven't started, but they were definitely, uh, yeah, that's another whole different conversation, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but definitely they were like, Lucas, this is the future. It would be very good to see, uh, to see how this evolves because it could be a, a game changer. So that's actually how the whole um, concept and ideology of, of Pentestify, of Neo, this product uh, came, up, came along. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. I I am doing somewhat of the same thing, but I've never dabbled in AI, so my knowledge is limited to what's possible, right? Um, but I kind of taken the heuristic approach. Basically, I've gathered like a really solid understanding of how bytecode works and how common patterns mm-hmm. happen and auditing, um, and basically how critical vulnerabilities occur and unique. You, these kind of unique vulnerabilities occur because in web two and web web three, it's quite different to find something that's extremely detrimental in, in web three. It's, a, it can be either two thing, two things, <laughs> yeah, separate transactions that kind of like build up to something or multiple contracts interacting to basically formulate a context where the original contract is basically open for exploitation um, or it can be a combination of both right um, in web 2 that there's no basically there's no concept of sequence of transactions and you know that kind of stuff so exactly it is a whole new world and that's why nothing has been developed and i think i don't know if we're the only two people <laughs> building this kind of stuff <laughs> so I think I found my competitor, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's quite interesting I, using a AI and deep deep learning, <laughs> um, basically, to find this. I, I think there was a paper from I forget his name, but it, it's either Wu or Wen, um, and they did a a paper on AI for <laughs> for fuzzing, I think. But it is quite interesting. I don't know what what they actually specifically do, but um, yeah, it, it definitely is the future if you can get something running, which it seems like you have. Then you're gonna kind of, you're gonna capture the whole market, right? But first of all, how did you even get into all this AI stuff as well? And if you were to take the path again to learning learning AI um, relevant to cybersecurity, what what would you do to kind of get to this point where you're at now in the fastest way possible? Hmm. Now that's a, that's a very good question that I'm actually very happy answering, especially for the people listening, and especially given how the Web3 space um, is. The journey that there are many things to say. Uh, one of them is be careful when passion is your main driver. Since 13, 14 years old that I started to code, this why, how, what if was definitely my passion. I couldn't yeah. resist but to ask those questions. A lot of people misinterpret passion for what their hype is. And the problem with that is unless you haven't properly detected that that feeling is a true passion that is not going to get away, given that it's emotionally based, uh, most likely they will get in they will get into the depths of it all onto Web3, for example. Yeah. And then six months later, one year later, they will realize that now they've fallen in love with another hype, right? Yeah. So I am a super reflective person. Mm-hmm. I live uh, many hours of the day in, in uh, the thinking plane, right? And I was I felt that I was sure that these technology and cybersecurity were um, kind of my passion and were going to be until the last day, right? Mm-hmm. So if you can feel it, then it's easy. If not, you should really question whether it is a hype based on emotions and we are highly emotional beings, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or whether it's something that is going to keep um, every single day of the uh, of, of, of your life and even it's getting stronger by the day. Um, but the second point as well, equally as important is I didn't start studying AI out of passion. It was mostly because I wanted to be successful in cyber and I didn't see a way of being successful with my own business. And again, this was, I was about 15 years old. So extremely, extremely young. Yep. Um, and I didn't see a way doing this without AI because of the amount of data that the world has. I just didn't see a way. Um, I just felt that if I didn't take AI into consideration to help me, if I didn't harness the power of AI, I will become what we say the, the cog in the machine, right? Mm-hmm. So then year after year, I realized that I was getting a bit of a competitive edge having this double focus, right? So yeah. the passion actually started coming from the kind of the level and the knowledge that I had from AI, but originally it was mostly because I didn't see a way to succeed where I really wanted to succeed in cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of this kind of the, the, the main advice that I give, uh, which is very, very difficult because again, it is emotional, is in Web3, we, we don't stop hearing about the, the hypes or 
uh, you know, uh, with Pepecoin, all these um, small waves that people surf, and many of them are extremely lucrative, right? But I am a, and again, this is my personal opinion, but an opinion that I've seen in myself and especially in other people way more successful than I am, Mm -hmm. uh, that has absolutely worked, but unfortunately is not the easy way. It is being able from the foundation, Mm -hmm. learn how things work, be consistent. um, And if you have two options to create that new small trend where you're actually standing on the shoulders of, of giants instead of understanding what the giant is, yeah. then it's okay, but you should know that that is only temporary. What is going to give you purpose in life, what is going to give you true happiness is not riding small waves. It is rather riding the biggest wave of your life that you truly believe in. And mm-hmm. and therefore, my recommendation is do not jump on new things that you don't believe that in five years you won't be better at because you would have already left them and things like that. By this, I'm not, I'm not saying don't take any risks because that risk could lead to something longer than five years or maybe less, less than one year. But for sure, have some principles, some pillars that you're based on. In my case, it was cyber, AI, and blockchain. And if that is aligned with your principles, then most of your decisions are already made and those will be very simple and most importantly, uh, the biggest and most important ones in your life. So not jump into the new shiny thing, but rather being sure that what you're in is what the world needs, what you love, and what you're good at. Yeah, I I 100% agree. If you don't have passion in something and you've got to test this, whether you're constantly thinking about it, um, basically all the time, I think, it's what I experience. (laughs) But (laughs) I think, yeah, you definitely need passion. Otherwise, there's no longevity in in basically the task you're, you're, um, you're trying to complete. And you've also got to, you know, try and complete something that's going to be worthwhile, like try and solve a massive problem. I think these small ones are great, but if you really want to bring innovation, then you've got to, if you really want to like innovate and change the world slash the space, I think it's the difficult things that are going to do that. Not these quick little, you know, scripts of like one week. I mean, they're possible. Like, yeah, you can a hundred percent do that, but the really mm-hmm. difficult problems are, are what's going to like revolutionize the space. And I think this is definitely one of them. Um, having said that, now that we know how to basically find something to pursue in this case, let's say AI, how do we get into AI and learn about, you know, deep enforcement learning and all that kind of stuff? For sure. So the, again, I, I love always going to the base of it all. When I started learning about AI, I, well, first of all, you have to know the reason why that's the case. In my case, it was cybersecurity is not only about data, it's also about behavior. What are humans good at? what are machines better at? Mm-hmm. And uh, AI was in was complementary to what humans were. And out of all the technologies out there, I didn't choose, let's say, uh, augmented reality. I didn't choose, um, you know, uh, VR, which was a big uh, thing back then as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though we are hearing about it again with uh, with Apple's new headset and so on, but it's been yeah. for a while uh, <laughs> in, in, in our lives, right? Yeah. So if you truly have a valid reason and you don't have to be a genius at it, you just have to have a good common sense mm-hmm. that that technology makes sense, then that is the first step. Um, the yeah. second one is I started reading a book by MIT about the fundamentals of mathematically speaking. So okay. pretty much statistics, probability. Yeah, the core mathematical concept is like if you want to study ZK, right? You have to start with crypto, cryptography. Yep. And that is a lot of maths um, that normally people <laughs> avoid, but it is the, the, the basic of, of it all. Then that is quite theoretical. There is little practice, honestly speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, but right after that, I... I know that one of my learning styles is following, let's say, online videos, tutorials, and right. coding at the same time. I don't know why, but that truly just clicks in my brain with whatever yeah. it is. So um, so doing that, but most importantly, coding, it's on the right. They said that if you uh, read something, you're about to retain it, um, I think it was about 10 or 20%. But yeah. if you Quiet. hear, read... And practice, it's 90% likely to remember what yep. you and understand what you, uh, what you learned, right? Mm-hmm. So at least scientifically, uh, I'm happy that that has, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, those tutorials, uh, and again, I start with, I'm never afraid with starting with the basis from, from zero, even if I have to 
to go back at 20 years of or, or things like that mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be afraid and um, and then you grow to the advanced level honestly doing your own project the main reason why you got into this field in the first place yeah so so yeah I would say for me I'm a bit more theoretical than practical mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people say let's say 80% uh, hands hands on and then 20% practice I would be more like at the beginning, 60% theory and 40% practice, and then maybe 60% practice, 40% theory. Uh, mm. So yeah, it's, it's quite, quite balanced. Got you. I'm, I'm quite the opposite, actually. <laughs> I go straight <laughs> yeah. into practice. I know I'm quite unique in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, um, like I can read a lot, but not really retain it. But if I don't have a reason, <laughs> like an underlying reason. Um, so my kind of methodology for building massive projects is basically, all right, what, what do we need to get to this, the next level? And okay, what, what are the problems we need to solve? Okay, let's solve this problem. Mm -hmm. What is required for this problem to be solved? And then go into the topics or basically things that can help s solve that, that, that first little small task to get to the next level mm -hmm. and then continuously go up there. And if I hit a, if I hit a path that requires more information or something I haven't built, I'll go back and build it then try and you know fix that that problem right so i think in my exactly. personal experience it's been like incredibly effective and i've kind of accelerated my time in in the coding space i've only coded for two years but i've gotten to a point where i feel i'm in a very small niche and i'm kind of getting to a point where i'm pioneering some stuff just like you <laughs> maybe in a different way though um without the use of ai but deep enforcement learning i i'm quite interested in ai it's just uh, very hard to start. I think I was under imp under the impression you needed basically servers and a lot of computational power to hold all those results, and I didn't know how to start any of that. But to be fair, I never tried. So I yeah, guess it's a, a big point to <laughs> touch on as well. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure, it's a, it's a valid point uh, what you mentioned, um, and uh, I mean that speak uh, regarding the first point that you said probably. Um, it is only that I'm thick-headed and I prefer to be a bit more theoretical, uh, theoretical, but I don't know if that happens to someone else, maybe one of your listeners, that mm -hmm. um, I'd rather know how big or the, the total size of the field before yeah. I start practicing, right? I know that when I'm practicing uh, without learning the theory, I get those learnings 100%. I understand what I'm doing and I learn a lot. But yeah. however, I have the feeling that I go in blind. Yeah. But um, if I know how ready, how big the field is, I don't have to be, of course, an expert at it. I could even be a beginner, but with a very clear theoretical understanding of what the field is, how big it is, and kind of the the, the borders, the limits of, of the current uh, state of the research, right? Yeah. Then applying the the kind of I, I see a better direction, um, which is mm -hmm. always very important, but. Again, yeah. it might come down to me being thick-headed and, and trying to get this theory. Maybe it would have worked better and I would have been able to accelerate a little bit more my learning. But uh, I definitely prefer that methodology. But mm -hmm. yeah, most of the successful people that I know as well um, use are a bit more similar to you in terms of learning, a bit more practical than theoretical. But yeah, I, um, either of them, uh, I think, is as long as it works for you, then that's the, that's the case. Right. Uh, that's, you've already made your case, so, so that's good. Yeah. And, and regarding your second point about AI, um, it is true that you do need to train the AI models. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are two ways to training, of course, uh, to train it, either through unsupervised learning or supervised learning or something in between mixed. But given, given a, an unsupervised model, which seems to be the, the, the most popular one today and what I believe the, the future is, mm -hmm. even though that is a generalization because it depends on the application, of course. Yeah. But um, you can already use pre-trained models. In fact, there is a huge library that I recommend you kind of research. It's called Hagen Face. Uh, I think it's based in France, but they do an amazing job. Yeah, Hagen Face. Uh, it has nothing to do with AI, the name I know, okay. <laughs> but <laughs> Hagen Face. Yeah, and they have, I think they are the world's largest or one of them uh, with LLM models, which is like chat GPT, yeah. uh, GPT-4, right? Um, and you can already find pre-trained models, right? And in terms of compute power, um, if the model is already trained on inference, right? You yeah. don't need a lot of, your laptop can by far, 
do it, do an amazing job. You know, mm. uh, I was showing the other day the the CEO of Stability AI, which is something like Midjourney. Yeah. You know, um, and he said by the end of next year we would already have the entirety of ChatGPT in our phones offline. <laughs> so okay. imagine having that huge power, all the terabytes and petabytes of information yeah. in a few gigabytes in your phone, right after the model have been trained and and the models have been trained and all the weights in the in the neural nets have been correctly adapted, right? So mm-hmm. you don't need huge power if you're not training the model and you can get pre-trained models. So mm-hmm. again, the the horizon or the it's it's up to you of how far you want to get into that. So yeah, I recommend to you and to everybody trying to to do it to definitely just jump on it. Quite surreal that this is a, a possibility in the future, in the quite near future. Just like how storage <laughs> was incredibly expensive and uh, it was just yeah, basically incredibly expensive for one, one gigabyte like a couple of decades ago. Now it's just a kind of standard, right? And it's going to be the same with AI at, at some point exactly. where. It, it's its size isn't going to matter um, as much as now. It's just going to be mm-hmm. kind of like integrated into any anything. Um, but yeah, I think exactly. that whole thing is is quite interesting. And you've basically built a SaaS around this, right? As well, um, where people just put in SaaS. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you basically put in the Solidity code, and it, it just finds the vulnerabilities, right? It just spits them out. Um, is, is that kind of correct? It's actually more like your um, your direction as well. More or less, there, there are only 3%, 4% of all the smart contracts out there that have their Solidity code um, verified, right? Yep. All the rest are directly bytecode. So mm-hmm. we said, again, we are post-deployment and we don't want to capture you know, uh, 60% of 4% of all the smart contracts. Okay, so that doesn't part. sound too... Yeah, so we act directly in the bytecode. Um, and as you probably know, even the bytecode, pre-deployment and post-deployment is not the same. Yep. So we already have an edge of, it's good that you use static and dynamic um, and formal analyzers mm-hmm. um, and verification techniques, but however, the bytecode itself is different. Yep. Uh, even your DevOps or your deployment options, um, you you know, you do not pay attention to X things that happen to was it to Euler Finance or uh, something like that hugely? And it yeah, was due to a deployment. Exactly. So um, anyways, I don't want to point any fingers at protocols that <laughs> might not have been hacked. So sorry if, if that wasn't the, the one, but uh, it was uh, someone as big as, as them for sure. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we act, uh, we um, the company is quite simple. They simply give us the address of the smart contracts. Okay. Per smart contract, we build them every month the same. Uh, so far, we do that. We do it in fiat, but next, um, it is Pentestify will be a DAO uh, in the future as soon as uh, zero knowledge proofs become a bit more powerful for AI. Yep. At that point, we'll make a DAO out of it and it will be everything um, Ether based um, or yep. any native currency mm-hmm. um, based. So, so yeah, we build per smart contract per company. Uh, per month mm-hmm. and in a, in a monthly basis in kind of the, the traditional startup way uh, yeah. before it is transformed into, into a DAO. One thing that I have noticed trying to basically set up my um, model for sales is that if you do mm-hmm. do this kind of bytecode thing and you do like a SaaS, right, some mm-hmm. malicious user could come in and put in a contract and see if there's a, a vulnerability, then you basically spit it out to them and then they can use it, right? A black hat can come in and do it. How do you basically avoid legal implications <laughs> when it comes to uh, <laughs> these kind of players? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, but of course, the, the, they're, they're always a solution to a problem. You probably learned that in entrepreneurship, <laughs> there is a solution to yeah. everything. One of them that we use is uh, you're only able to input the address of the smart contract that you are now an owner of. And uh, okay. if that if that okay. smart contract for any reason doesn't have a precise owner, you have to verify um, that you still are in control of, of that. It could be by the domain extension or several uh, two two more things that uh, we already have in, in in the pipeline. However, you mentioned something um, as well. A second point, quite uh, quite smart, which is even if you're the right user, right, you don't have any any kind of Malevolent, malevolent um, intentions, right? Um, bad intentions to to hurting, you know, any any other smart contract or the, the smart contract for the company you work for, right? You might want to scan it and then say, all right, it's done. I'm only going to pay, you know, ten um, ten dollars uh, 
per smart contract, you know, but mm -hmm. I'm going to use it less than a month. So it might even be for free. You know, the thing that we do offer is, again, we've already thought that you've already done all the static, dynamic, formal verifications. If you haven't, then you're going to be more useful. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to be um, you're going to find more errors in, in, in our tool, but we already suppose that user has gone through that. And the main value that we give uh, to the user is that continuous monitoring. That means that we save all the expert vulnerable patterns, we call them. And those are the multi-sensory patterns that are vulnerable using different models of AI uh, in-house at mm -hmm. Pentestify. So we store all of this in the database. And if any other smart contract in the world gets hacked using a, um, gets hacked that had a similar pattern, the team in, uh, immediately gets notified. So that means that we are, so to say, a worldwide oracle of or observer of everything that happens worldwide for a smart contract when they get hacked. Yeah. And if they have a similar vulnerable pattern, the team gets initially gets immediately notified uh, before they get hacked. So mm -hmm. that is the main advantage of that continuous monitoring. This is why we are not extremely expensive. We build $10 per smart contract, which is not it's not going to break your bank, even if you're a protocol with uh, thousands of uh, smart contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not it's not a lot per month, but it is definitely enough to definitely worth the price for getting that worldwide oracle of vulnerabilities and get immediately notified when that happens. It's it's actually quite cheap ten dollars. You would not see this anywhere else, I think. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But um, I want to switch the topic over um, to kind of around building a business since you have had successful ones and also failures, which is, uh, I think, necessary for any successful <laughs> business owner. Of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would like to, to ask, how did you really start these all up? Um, basically, as you, by yourself, <laughs> were you solo or did you get like a partner? And then basically expanding into sort of a greater, more scalable or scaled up team structure, uh, kind of wearing multiple hats and then designating what to be, what needs to be done. No, for sure. It's, if I were to simplify the journey, it would be solo, co-founder, and then community. Mm -hmm. uh, the current one is community, and I'll explain in, in detail which one, uh, which which one, uh, whatever yep. each one means. And so the the solo at the beginning, I began freelancing, building websites full stack, uh, and securing them. Right after, I said, um, "You're probably not going to encounter many." full stack freelancers with expert knowledge in cyber. So for sure, at least you won't get hacked. <laughs> and I'm going to build your uh, your React Angular website. That was, again, many years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, as uh, Pretty much as soon as Angular came out, React didn't even exist at that time. So, so yeah, I started doing that. And that actually taught me a lot about how to talk to clients. Mm -hmm. Each experience taught me like several key things. And being a freelancer, uh, full stack dev, uh, again, I was a yeah, young teenager, taught me how to really, I made all the mistakes possible, how to communicate late, how not to talk to clients. I, I did all those mistakes and I corrected them. Mm -hmm. So I really learned how important communication is, whether with uh, clients or with other people in my team. And at that time, it was uh, it was only me. So it was mostly how to talk to clients. Mm -hmm. Right after I had a historic essential mentor mm -hmm. that recommended me to, to, yeah, in order not to sell myself twice, right, to get an academic uh, degree. Um, mm -hmm. At that time, I, I didn't even go to university. Um, and I did uh, electronics and computer science, and then a master in cybersecurity inf infosec uh, with blockchain uh, at UCL. So I, yeah, during that time, I actually created my second company, the one I exited. And mm -hmm. I, the kind of the, the main points, I, I was at that time, I was a technical founder, CTO. Mm -hmm. And the roles, really, the hats that I had to wear were multiple. I was, I was one of the, of, of the, yeah, of the co-founders that led the the fundraising process so something that i hadn't really done before mm -hmm. um, i was as well actively in hiring new people something that i had never done before i had to learn how different nationalities think and like to talk about things money clients uh, partnerships especially around the german the french the british uh, spanish 
uh, the Americans. So um, really learning the difference between them both and what they value, I would say that was my biggest take. So how to really start managing a team and how to how to really smell the intentions of people, I would say. Right. Uh, how um, that was really mostly soft skills and even actually self-protection, so to say, um, in, in my second company. And then um, at the end, I by then I had already mastered how to hire, how to manage a team, and most importantly, how to do that remotely with six plus hours of time difference. Yeah. Uh, so when I jumped directly into Pentestify, I I already learned a new concept that the world was changing, and that was community. Overnight, you can have a thousand new employees called contributors in your protocol, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to deal with HR yet. Uh, you don't have to deal with uh, legal yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do believe that is one of the biggest advantages of um, of community. I'm not saying Pentacify is for the community. In fact, it is our biggest uh, objective and, and next steps right now. But I've definitely learned a lot and I'm still trying to master how to harness the power of community and mm -hmm. a talented team at Pentestify. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I have, again, UCL uh, on my side with one of the best um, professors and researchers in the world uh, in terms of in, in the field of smart contract security, blockchain, cryptography, and, and AI, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, DeepMind, which was bought by Google, you know, OpenAI, one of OpenAI's biggest competitor mm -hmm. um, came from UCL, uh, the founders. So uh, there is a lot of talent right there and I'm quite fortunate to, to, to have them right now uh, in, in, in this journey. Um, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, I'm really learning the next step for me is how to harness the power of community. Yeah, 100% agree. Community is, can be a, an amazing thing and it can really, it, break or or make a company as well without a community or yeah basically without a community that wants to use your product or even contribute slash help build it in in a way where people want to use it market it um and promote it there's not going to be a company an underlying company right <laughs> it's just exactly <laughs> kind of a project without users users is the main exactly. factor to any company and that's what you should focus <laughs> yeah. on because without the users hmm. There's no income, and without income, it, there's there's no there's no company. There is, nothing, there is no <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I think one thing you did touch on was uh, understanding different nationalities and what they value. I think I've never heard anybody kind of mention that before. Um, and that your own <laughs> yeah. protection, right? Is that kind of to gauge what their underlying intentions are? Um, or yes. something completely different? It is um, It is mostly to, as you said, business is purely social-based. We, a good business is there to serve and offer value. And of course the monetary is just a byproduct, but it's mainly offer value to other humans, uh, whether it's B2B, B2B2C, uh, C2C, whatever it is. Yeah. So when I mean learning how different communities and um, countries uh, operate and, and mostly their mindsets, their underlying philosophy and, and ways of thinking is mostly to, to let them know that they are important to us, that we understand their needs, and most importantly, that we are trustworthy. So um, to give you an example, and that we are compatible, um, you can be trustworthy, but not want to be with, uh, with a partner, with a girlfriend or, or whatever it is, yeah. uh, because you don't trust them, because they don't um, or even if you trust them, maybe they're not compatible with who you are right. uh, to make sure that was never the case. Right. You um, I had to really get to know what was important to them in, in which case, for example, one of the main differences that, that, that I saw about the uh, about the U.S. is, for example, speed um, as well as business size. It right. is it is that they value quite a, quite a lot. It's uh, everything moves extremely fast and in extremely big uh, dimensions. In the UK, the British, um, they value, yeah, what they see, what they want to see is whether they like a technology or not, how likely is that technology to be omnipresent in the world? And if so, let us help you. <laughs> 
So right. you have to you have to tell them what value you bring and how that value is going to be important to them, even if it goes against them. See, uh, UK is a country that fascinates me. It's in one side, it's an extremely traditional class based um, classist um, country, but at the same time, they have a din. Uh, dynamism, right? And ways of thinking that are extremely flexible and agile. So I I really value that. And yeah, and then France, Spain, they, well, they're very different between them, but France, for example, they value a lot the individual's rights and the well-being of the users and kind of uh, the safety around the product. So if you really tailor what you say during the negotiations to those things, you can really make the, the person believe in you and most importantly show that you care enough about their culture um, to be compatible with them and hence what you're offering is the same is an image of who you are so mm-hmm. at least in a start startup when you're early stage that's that's a big thing yeah okay so that that's very insightful i've never heard of that and i it's, it's <laughs> actually uh, quite deep i think that nobody even considers right um and i think this would be especially mm-hmm. important for vcs uh so knowing what kind of vcs their oh, yeah. so, um, I've never really like delved into that game, but you have, and I would love to know more about like ne- negotiations that happen, how to basically sell your idea and get people on board. For VCs, the game is definitely for VCs. The game is a little bit different because they're very good. Th- I mean, thanks to them, the startups, many of the startups are alive, so they are a fundamental arm of the government of a country or mm-hmm. of corporations, if we talk C- uh, CVCs, to, of course, um, make this community alive. So they're extremely essential for for startups. However, I um, sometimes you, you really have to know that you're playing a different game when you're talking to VCs. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I see repetitively is how biased they might be comparing old technologies to new ones. And I, I, I do believe that they will need to radically change their paradigm. No pun intended, by the way, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, in, in the past, really no, no pointing fingers at no one, honestly speaking. Uh, but it's uh, they really have to change their mindset into truly understanding how the technology is going to change and um, not how it's changing the world. Um, that's what they're focusing on. But also we live in a world of, of blockchain if we put Ethereum as the as the main um simply because that's the, the main technologies that i use it might be different from from other people but in in the DeFi sector at least 75 percent are ethereum based or ethereum compatible blockchains right so so using that as an example the whole eips right one of the whole eips uh dilemma is if you really understand the future potential changes of blockchain mm-hmm. you might avoid many many vcs from investing into an idea into a company, even if they have an already existing MVP or product that might be completely washed out by an EIP update. And for all, all of you that don't know what EIP is, is simply Ethereum improvement proposal. So those are new changes to the blockchain uh, that might completely ignore or be incompatible with your protocol, right? So always watch out for if you're doing an MEV, for example, a company, how are future EIPs going to change uh, MEV in the future, right? So I'm a, I'm a big fan of EIP and I always keep up to date with that. Happy to, to, to answer any, any questions about that. But the, but it is essential for VCs to know and understand the technology, how Ethereum creates a deflationary product, let's say, how different improvement proposals will change or invalidate many of their portfolios uh, companies mm-hmm. and uh, become technical more than as, as much as business. Yeah. So you basically got to explain the overall architecture and what's the competitors like, what, what are your basically benefits compared to them and how you can mm-hmm. change the whole space um, or at least outcompete, I guess, is, a, is another mm-hmm. way. And I think another thing to, to touch on is how do you even find these, these kind of people willing to invest money in in experiments, mm-hmm. basically. No, that's a, that's a fair question, especially for those starting out. Um, first of all, there are different kinds of individuals willing to give you money. There is the FFF, <laughs> friends, uh, friends, family, and fools. That yeah. is normally the, the first round of, of investment that you might get. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one is BAs, business angels. 
Uh, those are individuals, uh, single individuals. Maybe they're uh, BAs consortiums as well, not VCs, BA, uh, BA consortiums, but uh, or collectives. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are imagine one person, previous co-founder or current co-founder of a successful uh, protocol that is already a three three X entrepreneur uh, already knows how the game works and wants to. Uh, pick different stocks and believe uh, in in the market probably because they received uh, it was life saving uh, a, v- a BA investment that they had in the past so they want to give back to the community. So finding those individuals, well, first of all, knowing that they exist is the first step, and the second one is through programs like incubators, through um, pages like Twitter is already is starting to become a place for for BAs to recruit. To see mm-hmm. to see how the market is, but in in our case, we we got incubated by Station F, which allegedly is the world's uh, largest incubator. Uh, so uh, mm-hmm. at least it's it's big, um, and yeah. we were selected there at top forty, future forty. So from the thousand startups that they have every year or two years, they select forty. The, the most um, successful ones or the, the mo- with the most potential. And they give one of the perks, for example, is passing along their current network of, of um, BAs and VCs, kind of a list of startups, right? And the last group is VCs or CVCs, um, corporate VCs being the, the, the latter. Right. And those are, some of them require you to complete a form online and there is no other way to contact them. Another way is um, doing a tiered method, uh, mm-hmm. knowing how to uh, reach out with tier three VCs that you know might not be ideal for you, and yeah. walking up that ladder through recommendations, warm intros, and and so on. So that's that's a good option as well. For sure. And what what are the really benefits of getting these people on board and getting money from them in exchange for I guess equity in your company? Mm-hmm. It's, um, I mean, as Ray Dalio said, uh, one of the biggest uh, hedge fund um, managers, um, I think he's retired now, but he's definitely on a mission to, to educate people in, in this matter, mm-hmm. is getting funded means mainly two things. First of all, the, the stamp, the recognition of trust for other companies to say, this VC has trust in me. And not only that, I have a huge community now that I belong to. Uh, I am visible to the rest. You know, you pass from private to public, you know? (laughs) Um, And yeah, and that is already, as I said, a stamp. The second one is it accelerates your productivity. You buy productivity. Instead of being slow on growth, you buy literally your productivity to accelerate the product, to accelerate the growth. Um, And, you know, whether it's the product of the growth it really depends on, on every stage. There is pre-seed, you know, 100K, 200K, 1 mil. There is seed, 5, 10 mil. There is series A, 20, 30, and, and, and so on, B, C, D, yeah. and all the all the different mixes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so those things are, yeah, give you that trust, that network, and, and most importantly, that stamp. However, one little note that I would like to make is many people do think that VC is the only option, and they only think in terms of size, and again, not to point fingers at anybody, but really that depends on the culture of each country, right? Yep. So um, there are many companies that could have been extremely successful without VC fundraise. And most importantly, VC fundraise is not going to accelerate whether you fail fast or you succeed fast. It right. is only if you start up that idea, the team, or whether you still have more to learn or whatever reason it might be, totally respectable reason, of course, taking a VC on board it's actually going to lead to a slower death and more problems and more stress hmm. uh, and actually, you know, PTSD of, of entrepreneurship. So oh, right. um, I'm actually starting to change slightly my mindset towards VCs, mm-hmm. uh, not to not get them, but rather double think, double question at first, whether you can really grow organically, prove to the world that your idea, there is a little piece of wood, you know, the words your MVP that yeah. is burning, in other words, users using it uh, successfully, yep. that whenever you get VC, you're just adding more wood to the fire, right? Which only leads to one thing, more fire. So mm-hmm. as long as you have, you truly have balanced your, your options and you know that uh, VC is the only way, then do it. But otherwise, do not take that as the status quo of I'm an entrepreneur, where's the next call for the VC? Because yep. growing organically, it is ultimately... 
an extremely respectable option and it leads to more stability in the future, less conflict and, and things like that. If you don't need VCs, basically don't take them. Um, is what exactly. You're yeah. So- exactly. Think three times before you take VCs because you might need to prove to yourself that the idea works by itself. And actually by putting yourself at risk in difficulties, you're truly going to learn and accelerate that whole truth of the MVP that sometimes money kind of fogs away. Yeah. You don't want to be blinded by, okay, we have an idea. Let's, let's get some money involved and try and build this. But then later down the road, figure out that the idea doesn't work and now you're stuck with the money and <laughs> dealing with all exactly. these people, right? Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think I'm taking the kind of route where it's organic. Uh, I don't see mm-hmm. a need for VCs and I don't want, like, it doesn't kind of improve anything when I'm basically building the whole architecture and still figuring out what to do at like a, a fundamental level. There's no, money doesn't change that in any way apart from, I guess, bringing exactly. someone else aboard to think and think full time with me. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> yeah, that's also another challenge in itself, finding the right people and uh, people with aligned Absolutely. values and intentions, which can take away from the time being uh, spent on the product, right? But yeah, I think this has been in- incredibly insightful and I... I've learned quite a bit and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, but uh, we are getting, of course we have gone over a little bit, but um, it's been a pleasure meeting you and talking to you for the first time. And I hope <laughs> and testify it explodes with success. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's a lot of great Thank things you. coming in the future with the, the AI cybersecurity field. And I'm super intrigued to see how that, uh, that how play that, how that plays out down the line. Absolutely. And thank you very much for, for having me here. It's been a real pleasure to see as well a, a fellow security engineer. Best of luck with uh, your startup. For sure, you're into something big. It mm-hmm. is only down to execution. I can already smell the passion, um, you know, from the microphone away. Uh, so, <laughs> so for sure, I already can see you've already succeeded at this. Uh, it is only the byproduct that you're, that you're waiting for. And that explosion is, is, is uh, to come for sure. And um, yeah, yeah, regarding the the, the journey, I'm, I'm very happy as well to to potentially help people uh, that listen to to this podcast whenever. Um, if if you hear this and you're going to to the DeFi Security Summit, I'll be there or DAPCON later on this year in October in, or in September, sorry, in Berlin, I'll be there as well uh, as a speaker. So more than happy to 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 mix with uh, with you or with either of of your listeners and and, and talk about it or simply on. On, on Twitter as well, LMC Security. I recently started creating a small community, so mm-hmm. so yeah, happy to happy to do that as well. Yeah, depending on when this comes out, hopefully uh, before all that stuff. But <laughs> yeah, man, it's been a great pleasure, <laughs> and I, I'm definitely going to keep in touch with you. Uh, I think we're on the same kind of path, but maybe a little diverging a little bit. But um, yeah, I think but that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't want to compete too much <laughs> <laughs> for, for for sure. And even so, the space is too big. Uh, yeah, to yeah. just to people. So uh, again, everything is is competition is is absolutely good, uh, better than nothing. I I believe. So it it's been a real pleasure, uh, and thank you again for for this opportunity. And hopefully you or other people get some some value out of this. Um, yeah. Hopefully it was a value for for some people. That's at the end the the objective of it all, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, and on that note, I would like to say thank you for listening and have a good night or day, everyone. Thank you, Bob.